Almighty God, our Father, we come before you now as we look at your word. We pray for your blessing in this part of the service. I pray, Lord, that you would just open our hearts to receive and our minds to understand. And I pray, Lord Jesus, for the anointing of your spirit to be able to preach your word this morning. That your word would become for each and every one of us a living word. For those of us here and for those who will be watching on the video, we pray, Lord, that you would just encourage us this morning. That you would just strengthen us. So, Father, we give this part of the service to you now. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. This morning, I want to encourage us to not be afraid. And uh, I know it's not always easy, and I say so often that I also have to practice what I preach, but it's not always easy to not be afraid. Sometimes a message is so important that the message needs to be told over and over again. Repeating that message so that people can take it to heart. Sometimes it just needs to be preached over and over again. So that message can take root in the hearts of God's people and it can bear fruit. It was a story of a man who was appointed to a church, a new minister, and he came highly recommended and he preached a sermon and everybody was blown away and they said, wow, this man is the right, this is the person we're waiting for. The following Sunday he preached exactly the same sermon. And they said, wow, well, that's a bit strange, but it was good to hear it again for the second time. Not too bad. The third Sunday he preached the same sermon. And they thought, yeah, what's going on with this guy? So when they spoke to the elders and said, you better speak to that minister, what's his problem? He's preaching the same sermon every Sunday. So he politely said to the people, the only reason why I'm doing it, because you never listened the first time. <laughs> and I think there is some truth in that. Sometimes we hear words, the word of God, we always don't take it to heart. And maybe we need to hear the same sermon over and over until, until we actually see the manifestation in the lives of God's people in regard to what the Word is saying. But it's easier said than done because a lot of it is not all that easy. And it's a work in progress. We, all of us are a work in progress. You know, God's Spirit works with us and He, and he guides us and He leads us and He anoints us and He blesses us. And from time to time we get it right and other times we get it wrong. But the idea is not to be afraid. The idea is not to give up. And in the reading today, we see how Jesus sends out the 72 or the 70, uh, as the Bible says, and they go and they do God's work and they're excited about it. But there's something that I looked up in the King James Version of the Bible, where the word fear not, where the, where the Bible says fear not, or don't be afraid, but I, I was looking specifically for fear not. And it occurs something like 63 times in the Bible. 63 times in the Bible, fear not. If that's not a word for us, then I don't know. Just that. The sermon can end just here. Fear not. Because the Lord says, I'm with you. Don't be afraid. And it's interesting that when we look at that, you see that Jesus literally repeats this message time and time again. It is a message that those around him needed to hear. They needed to hear that message. His pe the people around him, his disciples. And I believe we need to hear that message as well. Especially in the times in which we live. Don't be afraid. You see, those words knock the cobwebs from the dark corners of our lives. Don't be afraid. Jesus tells the disciples late one night when he walked across the lake and climbs into their boat. Don't be afraid. Take heart. You don't have to struggle against the storm anymore. Maybe that's a word for someone here this morning. You don't have to struggle against the storm. Don't be afraid. 
Jesus is in your boat, he's in your life. Don't be afraid, he tells the anxious, worried father whose child lies deadly sick. Only believe and your daughter will get well. She'll be restored to you. Don't be afraid, Jesus said. Don't be afraid, he tells the disciples sitting in a circle around him. Not now, not ever. Your father knows every last hair on your head and he delights to give you the kingdom. Every hair on your head is counted. I always find that amazing. For some of us, it's not such a bad, not too difficult for the Lord to do. But imagine, every hair in your head is counted. Don't be afraid. I knew you while you were still in your mother's womb. I've got you in the palm of my hand. In fact, he said, I've got you calm in the palm of my hand. You know, the thought that Jesus is with us and we don't have to be afraid. And then Jesus repeats this message because it's important and because we find it hard to accept. He repeats the message over and over and over until we can get it into our spirit. Don't be afraid. I'm with you. He's aware, you see, that fear comes easy to us, as easy as breathing. We all become fearful. Today, Jesus repeats this message, don't be afraid. He repeats it as he sends out the 70 of his disciples to prepare the way in every place that he will visit. They go before him. These 70, we are not given their names. They are not prominent. They are not like John or Peter or Andrew or the 12 disciples. They are quiet, uncertain, ordinary people, just like you and me. These 70, a number that stands for wholeness and completion, these 70 represents everybody, all of us. Jesus sent them out and he wants to send us out. I think maybe that's one of the weaknesses of the church. We don't always go out in the world to do what they did. Maybe that's a challenge to us. What do you think that they felt at that moment? Sent out in pairs to unfamiliar places, entering uninvited with a bold message to proclaim. They must feel like we do when we go forth from here to live the Christian life in all those places that Jesus wants us to go. That uncertain feeling. Like those 70 disciples, we too are sent forth and we return again every week, every Sunday, we come back here. And the reason why we come back here is to be inspired, uplifted, and to be sent out again. You'll notice lately I've been ending off the service by telling everybody, the worship is over, let the service begin. The reason why we come to church, there's a few reasons. Not just to see my hands of faith. <coughs> we come to church to see each other and to have fellowship. And that's wonderful. It's fantastic. And there was a time before we had the Sunday school, because we don't have the facilities, unfortunately. But we used to have eats after the service and tea and coffee. And that was fantastic. And we used to have great fellowship together. And all of that is wonderful. But the reason why we come to church uh, every Sunday is first of all to give thanks to God for the week that's gone by. To intercede and pray for those that we know will have a need and, and, who's going, and people who are going through things like we did this morning. But we also come on a Sunday to be uplifted, to be inspired, to go out into that dark and crazy world to be a witness to the power of Christ in your life. I don't believe that anybody can do that unless they have fellowship. Jesus said, where two or three are gathered, there I am in the midst of you. He, he, he established the body of Christ, the people of God. And he said the hand is as important as the foot. The eye is important as the ear. And when one part of the body suffers, we all suffer. But every part of the body is important to make the body function. 
and they function together. Can you imagine if your left foot decides to go left and your right foot decides to go right? Your body's going to have a problem. So the body needs to function together. And have you ever noticed how uh, certain parts of our body is more important than others? You know, when we do the outside, we look nice on the outside, we look pretty and all that, makeup and do our hair and oh, we look lovely. But just knock your little toe. Your whole body dives down to rescue your little toe. You don't even bother to look at your little toe. You don't even know it's there. It's insignificant. It's in your shoe. You don't even bother about it. But just knock that little toe against the table or something. Your whole body goes down to rescue that little toe. So the point of the story is that no one is insignificant. Each and every one of us are gifted and talented. And we function as the body of Christ to go out in the world and make a difference wherever we may find ourselves. So don't be afraid. The message we are to live out through our character and our actions may take us to unfamiliar places where we enter uninvited. And that's really where we need to go. Because you see, at the end of the day, when we gather together on the Sunday, it is wonderful, but it's not here where we really... Well, I mean, it does happen, because there are people visiting the church. They don't come to church too often. They come every now and again. They come into a church, and God's Spirit touches them, and they give their hearts to the Lord. And all of that's wonderful. It does happen. But it's not really here where evangelism takes place. The evangelism takes place out there, and then we bring them in here. And when they come in here, under the anointing of God's Spirit, as we worship Him, they are blessed. And they are changed. I mean, for me, the most wonderful thing is to see people giving their hearts to Jesus. It is the most amazing thing to see. When someone makes a commitment and comes up when there's an altar call and they give their hearts to the Lord and, and their lives are changed and the guilt is taken away. Wow. It is the most beautiful thing to, re, to experience and to receive in a crazy mixed up world. We are so much in the dark lately, literally. <laughs> it's wonderful when the light of Christ comes into our lives and lights us up. I want to send it to Eskom. Now I want to say that there are four fears of which he wants to free us. There are four fears that I believe Jesus wants to free us from. The first is the fear of people. That's true. We are fearful of people because we're scared to say something to them. We're not sure how they're going to react. We are to heal the sick ones. We are to call down a blessing on all we meet. We are to increase wholeness and health throughout the world. Some will like what we do and support us and others will not like and do what we say or what we are doing. And they will not support us. There will be others who will reject the gift that we offer the gift of Jesus Christ. They may even scorn us, but we free from fear of people when we recognize how in every one there appears deep brokenness. Don't judge a book by its cover. I want to say to you this morning, don't be afraid of people. Do not judge a book by its cover. I've been, I've been before I retired and, and worked here, I was part of the Anglican Church for over 30 odd years. Now I've met some amazing people in the Anglican Church, wonderful Christians. But many of them were born in starch. They don't, if you look at them in the, from the front, they don't smile, they don't move. I had to pull out all the stops to make them laugh and to do things. And But you know what I found amazing? That's why I say, don't judge a book by its cover. And you look at people and they stare back at you like you're standing back at me now. Say, what's he going to say now? And they would stare back at you and you're wondering if they're listening to what you are saying. If they're taking in what you are saying. You know, and you're wondering if they're hearing. I remember it's in Marks in Athens. There was an elderly lady in, a, in the late 80s, early 90s. 90s. And uh, she would burst any preacher's bubble if you think you're a good preacher.
Because as soon as you open your mouth, she would throw her head back and fast asleep. And you, you pitch and you hit on the counter on the, on the lectern on the pulpit. We had a, a pulpit there that's about three meters above contradiction. And you would hit and she would. But she was in church every Sunday. Every Sunday, Mrs. Clark. Every Sunday she was in church. And then she still got a cheek to shake her head at the door and say, Father, thank you. I called your father and I said, Father, that was a beautiful sermon. And I can hear yeah. <laughs> She had the gift of encouragement. <laughs> I've got no idea where I'm going. <laughs> but don't, the point I'm making is, you know, don't judge people because I've seen people look like that and they, they, they show no expression. But I know under the anointing of the Spirit, I know God is doing something. And then I make an altar call and about 80% of the congregation, 85% of the congregation comes up for prayer. So, you know, don't judge a book by its cover. You've got no idea what's going in the heart of men and women. So don't be afraid of someone. If you feel in your spirit that God has given you someone to talk to and He wants you to talk to that person, don't worry how they look and and, 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 you know, they, they could look a bit grumpy or they look like they're going to attack you. You'd be surprised. They may very well say something negative to you, but at least you planted the seed. I know, I've seen that before. You say something, the seed is planted, somebody gets all, oh, you know, I don't want to hear, I don't want to hear, I don't want to hear. Especially when there's a group of men together and they've got a lot to say. And then afterwards they come back and say, you know, I'm glad you said that to me. And when you are on your own, they come to you because they know who you are. They know you're the child of God. So when they're going through tough times in their life, when they're having struggles in their life, guess who they're going to come to? They come to you. So don't be afraid of people. They need help. They are broken inside. They need you. You see, what others reveal to us may not be the glad truth of their existence, but their pain. Whether these others know us for who we are is not the point. What's important is whether we do something to bring God's kingdom near. It's all about kingdom building. As I said, there are four fears that Jesus wants to set us free from. That was the first one, people. The second one is the fear of failure. Don't be afraid that you're going to fail. A lot of people don't want to exercise their gifts and their talents because they're fearful that they are going to fail. Jesus does not announce that success is all that matters. Jesus wants us to be faithful, not even successful. When we are faithful, He will take us to a place of being successful. He does not tell us to count the resistance to our good efforts simply by pushing harder in the same direction. He says that when people in a town welcome us, we to stay and do good among them. That's what he told the 70. Or the 72. But when they do not welcome us, we are to get up and go elsewhere. He told those 70, wipe the dust of your feet and go somewhere else if they don't welcome you. In each case, we brought, we brought God's kingdom closer into that person's life. You see, the public ministry of Jesus does not look like it comes to a successful end. Jesus' ministry didn't look like it came to a successful end. If people followed Jesus and they saw the miracles He did, raised the dead, and the way He, he changed the, the, that area, that part of the world, when people looked at His life, they didn't think it came to a successful end. He succe that his end was hanging on a cross, nailed to a cross. When people looked at that, they didn't, they didn't think that his ministry was a success. They thought that his ministry was a disaster. Even his own disciples ran away. Even they were disappointed. Until they got to understand that in fact his ministry was very successful. That dying on the cross was there to save the world. To save you and me. To give us the ability uh, to overcome the fear of death and then to get, send us the Spirit so that we can go out into the world and make a difference. You see, it's not what the, the kind of success that the world experiences and looks at. The success that God wants from us is to be faithful to Him 
and to trust Him and not to be afraid. And He will use us for His glory and for the extension of His kingdom. If God lays it on your heart to speak to someone, go and do it. Because you'll be surprised how things will turn out. Not only for you, but for the person that you spoke to. It can help them in their lives. You see, my sisters and brothers, Easter frees us from the fear of failure. <coughs> Many of us go through a Good Friday experience where we feel our world is coming to a part, coming apart. But I want to say to you this morning that when we have a Good Friday experience, when we feel that we've been nailed to a cross, when we feel that our lives are coming apart, we are suffering, where there is no hope, just remember, there is always an Easter. The tomb is empty. Jesus is alive. And because He lives, you will live. And because He died for you, you will be successful. And you can walk in the power of His name. And He will, and he will give you His Holy Spirit to lead you and guide you. All you have to do is ask. Now the third thing that uh, we are set free from is the fear of things. Things. Let's say things. I'll tell you whatever those things are that are so near and dear to you. Jesus tells the seventy not to take with them certain things that they may think they need. See, the problem does not lie with the items themselves. The problem lies with what may be our attitude toward them. Are those things more important to you than you yourself or your abilities and the power of God in your life? Don't depend and count on things. You see, lacking these things but wanting them may make us feel inadequate for what we meant to do. Possessing such things may blunt our sense of urgency about service to the kingdom and may bring about separation between ourselves and others. Now such things may seem important in this consumer culture. We are even taught that what we have that what we have determines who we are. I own, therefore I am. I own, therefore I am. In, insatiable desires, you see, my sisters and brothers, become a virtue. The way to the kingdom is different. We are released from the fear of things. What is important is not what we own, or even what we abstain from owning, but whether we travel light, as Jesus told his disciples, travel light. Whether we get where we need to go or not, Jesus is with us. He's with us. We depend a lot on modern technology. And believe me, I love modern technology. I believe God wants us to use all the modern technology we can to make the church services come alive and, and to use it for His glory and for the extension of His kingdom. But when modern technology fails... The Word of God is still powerful and it will still change people's hearts. A couple of Sundays we were in the dark here, but the light of Christ was here. And so technology can fail us from time to time, but the Lord will never fail us. He never used a microphone. He never used PowerPoint presentations. But people's lives were changed by the power of His Spirit. So the last fear that Jesus wants to set us free from is the fear of needs. I need this. I need that. Not once but twice Jesus tells the 70 that in their travels they to eat what's set before them. Eat what's set before you. I've always applied that to my life in the church. That's why I look the way I look. <laughs> what's that? I'm thinking of that. An Anglican priest. Um, he actually he left the Catholic Church and joined the Anglican Church. The big guy, he's like, like this. Barry Argent. Barry, if you ever watch this video, you know I'm talking about him. And the clergy would have meetings and you stand in a long queue uh, for your lunch or whatever. And then Barry would, <laughs> he would shout out to everybody, I'm blessed! What? 
He said to all the clergy, I'm blessed, I'm blessed, look at me, I'm blessed. And all look at him, he says, I'm blessed because the Bible says, open your mouth and I will fill it. <laughs> I don't think Sheila likes that when I say, I'm blessed, I'm blessed. Ah, oh, praise the Lord. They are to eat what is set before them. And really what he's suggesting is that they may do otherwise. That they may be fussy. They may become so zealous, so impressed with themselves that they would forget their hunger and become afraid of their needs. I've become fearful because my needs are not being met. How am I going to survive? Not only are the 70 told to eat, but they're told to eat what's set before them. Eat what is given to you. He says to them, they are to acknowledge their empty stomachs by eating in the presence of their hosts, in the company of their hosts. Now I want to tell you something. That is such an important ministry. To eat what your parishioners put in front of you. I know for a fact because um, I ministered in a Chinese community. 90% uh, of Chinese. And um, their culture is that when they give you something, you need, to, you need to eat it and you need to enjoy it and you need to show appreciation. It's a blessing to them if they want to give you something to eat. You, you never, I learned that very quickly, you never say, no, thank you, I don't need it, or I'm on a diet. No, no, Father, you can't be on a diet. You must eat that. Healthy for you. And, and the point I'm making is not even about you, it's about what's in their heart. They want to bless you. So Jesus says, eat what's, what is given to you and be a blessing to your host. In that way, they will declare their need, their dependence in a public fashion. Because as soon as you are open to them in that way and they feel comfortable with you and you eat in a meal with them, they will open themselves to you and you can minister to them. My sisters and brothers, we all have the same needs. Among them, food and shelter, affection and support and a feeling of accomplishment. Do we conceal our needs? Are we afraid of them? It's part of what it means to be human to admit our needs. Don't be afraid to admit your needs. Especially in a church context. I know it's always been difficult for me as a minister to admit what my needs are because in the ministry, ministers, pastors depend on the generosity of their congregation. They survive because of the generosity of their congregation. The congregation pays their salary and looks after them and their family. And so at the end of the day, you, you, th there's a balance be between having to take your pride and put your pride aside and say, I need this. I'm, I'm struggling, I need this. And accepting when God's people want to bless you. Always a difficult thing. Especially in, the, in, in our culture. To accept anything from anybody. But what Jesus says is that we need to admit our needs and not be shy about it. And, and he says, you know, uh, when, when, a, when an ox grinds the corn, you don't muzzle the ox. So it's okay in the ministry if you are doing God's work, to be blessed and to be fed by God's people. And why I'm saying this is to you is that when you go and minister to others and they want to bless you, put your pride in your pocket and say thank you to them and say thank you to God. And if you don't want what they're giving you, you can always give it to me. <laughs> I'm talking nonsense actually. But I mean, there's something profound and special about it. We laugh about it. But you see, when people give, they give you something because they want to bless you. And when you don't take it, you are taking away their blessing. Because the Bible says, blessed are those who give rather than those who receive. And so when you stop them from blessing you, you take away their blessing. Many times people would say that to me. And I would say, no, I don't need that. And they said, don't take away my blessing. And they really mean it. It is, my sisters and brothers, part of what it means to follow Jesus. 
was Jesus was not afraid to seek hospitality and support, he was not afraid to be dependent. Jesus trusted people to bless him and to help him and to be their queen. He went into many people's homes and he ate with them. He ate with Matthew the tax collector. Nobody would go into the house of Matthew the tax collector because he was considered a sinner, a terrible person. And Jesus went into his house and he broke that, that, that ugliness of those uh, followers. Even his own disciples said, what are you doing? And he said, you don't send a doctor to healthy people. And when Jesus went into the house of Matthew to eat the food there, it wasn't about the food, it wasn't about, um, about whether he, he goes in or not, it was all about Matthew and how he knew that would impact Matthew and all the people who are in Matthew's house because Jesus came into their house. He loved them. So put your pride in your pocket and enter in and be a blessing to others. So we need, Jesus wants to set us free from the fear of needs, the fear of things, the fear of failure, and the fear of people. He releases us from every form of fear through this sacramental sharing in His life, this freedom feast as we follow Him, as we serve Him, as we do His will. During this week come, that's coming, when you are, are dispersed in so many directions after the service, each of us will no doubt feel rising in our hearts at least one of these forms of fear. Put it aside. The fear will try to disrupt our discipleship, interrupt our journey to the kingdom. Don't allow that to happen. But if we listen, sisters and brothers, if we listen, we will also hear Jesus telling us again to each and every one of us here this morning, maybe in the whisper in your spirit, in your ear, Jesus is saying to each and every one of us here this morning, fear not. Don't be afraid. I'm always there with you. Amen. So let's turn to me in prayer. Father, we want to thank you this morning for your word that inspires us. We thank you, Lord, that you love us, that you died for us. Father, help us just to trust you in every situation. Lord, help us not to be afraid. We know it's not easy for, at times. We pray, Lord, that you would help us and that you would bless us. That you would fill us with your grace, with your goodness, and with your love. Give us the ability just to trust you. When you tell us to let go, help us just to let go, Lord, and to put our faith in you. And so lead us, Lord, every brother and sister here in this week as they leave this place. Just bless us all, Lord, as we go out into the world. Help us to not be afraid. Help us to let go and to trust you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Just as I was praying, I was thinking of the story of a, <coughs> of a man who falls off a, off, a, off a cliff. He was walking on the top of the mountains. He was hiking. And his foot slipped and he went sliding down the cliff. It was very high. And at the bottom was all mist. And he felt himself sliding down and he grabbed on the side as he was sliding and grabbed the branch. And he held onto that branch and he screamed for help. Help! Is anybody up there can help me? Please help me. Please help me. There was silence. And he shouted again. Somebody help me. Please help me. Because he thought if he, if he lets us go, he's going to be dead. And he hears a booming voice coming out of heaven. And he said, you can put your name there. Charles, let go. And Charles said, who, who is that? Charles, let go. Charles thought for a while and he said, and God said, it's me, let go. And Charles thought for a while and he looked up and he said, is there anybody else up there that can help me? <laughs> and then the branch broke. 
And Charles went sliding down the mountain only for about two meters because when he got through the crowd, he was only four meters from the ground. He was safe. Praise the Lord. Sorry. 